What is autoimmune encephalitis? Autoimmune encephalitis refers to inflammation of the brain that is caused by derangement of the immune system. Now, the immune system, as you know, has developed in order to allow us to fight off infections. However, that immune system is very delicately poised. And in some cases, the immune system can turn inwards and attack one's own body. In the case of autoimmune encephalitis, that attack occurs against the brain. So there are a number of categories of disorders that result in autoimmune encephalitis. We've known for many years that one can get an acute demyelinating attack, for example, on the nervous system that can result in a variety of physical and cognitive problems. This is called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. It is similar to the disease process multiple sclerosis, although in this case it's an acute attack and can be quite devastating. Over recent years, there's been a lot of interest and knowledge gained about autoantibody-mediated encephalitis. A classic example of this is anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So we've learned that antibodies, again, that are normally directed against infections, can actually bind to neurons or supporting cells in the brain and cause dysfunction of the nervous system. And that is a type of autoimmune encephalitis. So what causes autoimmune encephalitis? Well, it turns out, as is the case for many medical conditions, we don't actually know what drives the process. Um, what we do know is that there is a derangement or a shift in the immune system. We've gathered certain clues over the recent years that suggests that there are several things that can contribute to autoimmune encephalitis. So one, for example, is the presence of a cancer. So in the setting of a cancer, the body's immune system may direct its efforts to try to suppress the cancer. But in so doing, as a byproduct, there may be an autoimmune attack against the brain. So that's one potential driving force for autoimmune encephalitis. More recently, we've recognized that infections can actually drive the process of autoimmune encephalitis as well. A classic example of that is herpes simplex encephalitis, one of the most common infectious causes of encephalitis worldwide. It happens that in up to a quarter, a fifth to a quarter of cases, that one can develop an autoimmune encephalitis subsequent to the initial bout of infectious encephalitis. And so there is something about the infection and the damage to the brain that can elicit this immune response or this shift in the immune system, thus contributing to an autoimmune encephalitis. But in many cases, we are not able to identify a cancer or an infection that drives this process. And so similar to many autoimmune disorders, we're left with, uh, with a puzzle in that we don't know why this happens. What we do know is that the immune system is shifted in a way that it should not be, and therefore efforts are directed to try to rebalance the immune system in these individuals. The symptoms of autoimmune encephalitis really relate to the areas of the brain that are affected. And so it turns out that different types of autoimmune encephalitis may have a predilection for different parts of the brain and therefore may cause differential symptoms. However, a commonality amongst most of these autoimmune encephalitides is that there are changes in thinking, behavior, and potentially uh, onset of seizures. So as we discussed, autoimmune encephalitis can manifest in many different ways. And I'll give you a few examples. So 
anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is one of the most common causes of an autoantibody-associated encephalitis. And it has fairly distinct clinical manifestations. So the disorder is accompanied by acute changes in behavior, acute changes in thinking. Seizures can develop. There can be movement disorders as well that are new. And patients can rapidly progress to coma as well as what are called autonomic changes where heart rate and blood pressure may be uncontrolled. And so this is a relatively distinct clinical syndrome and one that we have grown to recognize over the past years. Contrast that with, say, anti-LGI1 encephalitis. This is another relatively common autoantibody-associated disorder in which individuals are typically older and they present with cognitive dysfunction and more subtle types of seizures. These individuals present quite differently from anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And again, this refers to areas of the brain and the types of uh, receptors on brain cells that are affected in these conditions. Now, there's additional complexity to all of this. I talked a little bit about anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And it so happens that the clinical manifestations can vary from childhood to adulthood. And so the clinical syndromes can be very different. And as a result, clinicians must be familiar not only with typical presentations of these disorders, but also with how they may evolve uh, over the spectrum of age. How is autoimmune encephalitis diagnosed? So there are a number of ways in which we try to provide supportive evidence for autoimmune encephalitis. As I mentioned, patients typically come in with changes in thinking and behavior, perhaps new onset seizures or movement disorders. So the clinical syndrome is very important to pay attention to. When a patient comes in with suspected encephalitis, one must rule out an infection and if one has done so, one also must rule out other conditions that can mimic encephalitis. And there are a whole host of conditions that can do so, ranging from strokes to tumors to intoxications. So the clinician must actually approach these patients with a very broad set of differential diagnoses in mind. So once infections have been ruled out and other mimics have been ruled out, one can focus on substantiating the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. And this is really done by several means. So a brain MRI can be very helpful. In a subset of patients with autoimmune encephalitis, there can be relatively distinct signatures on brain MRI that can point us towards that diagnosis. An EEG can sometimes be helpful as well. This occasionally shows distinct signatures associated with autoimmune encephalitis. Blood work and the lumbar puncture, that is obtaining cerebrospinal fluid from patients, are critical in establishing a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis as well, particularly for the autoantibody-mediated encephalitis. In those conditions, one can actually identify specific autoantibodies that target neurons or other supporting cells in the brain that are leading to the brain dysfunction. And in the proper clinical setting, in the setting of, of a clinical syndrome consistent with encephalitis, the presence of these autoantibodies is extremely helpful in defining the process as an autoimmune encephalitis. So let's turn to treatment of autoimmune encephalitis. So as we discussed, autoimmune encephalitis is a derangement of the immune system. And the treatments that are directed against the disease process are really meant to rebalance or quiet down the immune system. There are 
first-line treatments, that is, treatments that are given upfront initially in the acute stages of autoimmune encephalitis. And then there may be second-line treatments that are given when the first-line treatments are not having the desired effect. And then there are maintenance treatments that may be given to reduce the chance of further relapses of autoimmune encephalitis. First-line treatments include steroids, and steroids can come in a variety of preparations, uh, oral or intravenous. IVIG, which is intravenous immunoglobulin, this is actually pooled antibodies from a number of blood donors that are given to the individual by IV and are meant to quiet down the immune system. And plasmapheresis, or plasma exchange, as it is called, which one can almost think of as dialysis. One is essentially flushing out the immune components from the blood that are contributing to the autoimmune encephalitis and replacing it with more benign components. So each of those, steroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, alone or in combination, are typically considered first-line treatments. Second-line treatments include more potent medications that suppress the immune response. And these can include medications such as rituximab or cyclophosphamide. Again, these are very strong immune suppressive medications that can quiet down the immune system in an effort to stop the autoimmune encephalitis from causing further symptoms in uh, affected individuals. So how do patients with autoimmune encephalitis do? What are typical outcomes? Well, as we discussed, there are a number of causes of autoimmune encephalitis, and the outcomes are really related to the causes. In many of the autoantibody-mediated encephalitides, the dysfunction in the brain relates to the presence of the antibodies, and removal of the antibodies via the treatments that we've discussed can actually result in relatively rapid resolution of symptoms. And so outcomes can actually be quite good in autoimmune encephalitis. Now, that is not to say that this is a benign disorder. Certainly, in the acute phase, the disease can actually be fatal. Um, patients can develop very substantial brain swelling. They may develop changes in heart rate and blood pressure that are difficult to control. They may develop what is called status epilepticus, the condition of ongoing seizures that can have tremendous deleterious effects on the brain and on the body. And many of these patients in the acute phase are in the intensive care unit where a number of complications can arise, including bloodstream infections that can be debilitating or fatal. If patients survive the acute phase, as most do, they can be left with cognitive uh, or physical disability. The field has defined some of the physical disability that occurs in the setting of autoimmune encephalitis, but much work actually needs to be done in terms of identifying the cognitive dysfunction. Many patients are left with some degree of cognitive dysfunction that can be quite debilitating. For example, they may not be able to return to work. They may not be able to have the same types of interactions with friends and family that they did prior to the disorder. And it is these types of symptoms that are in great need of further characterization. 